Hello again, I am Blunty, and this unassuming little compact camera is the new Pentax MX-1. You may have seen my preview video of it from my adventuring at CES earlier this year. It's a 12 megapixel shooter with a nice fast lens and a 1 over 1.7 inch backlit CMOS image sensor. Now let's be honest, with camera phones pretty much teabagging the low and mid end of the compact camera business, these days a compact camera has to be a little more special than they used to be to get away with being called worthy of consideration. So yours truly is here to put the MX-1 through its paces and see how it measures up. Alright, let's start with the look and feel. It's a subtle, gently retro-inspired design with unsurprising hints back to its namesake, the original Pentax MX series film SLR cameras. The top and bottom plates are actually made from brass, so aside from feeling really nice, both the black and silver models will wear over time, revealing that beautiful underlying color, just like your favorite pair of jeans slowly wears in. It'll give each and every MX-1 owner a camera that's unique to them, giving it an earned look of a much loved and well used camera. Frankly, if this one was my camera and not a borrowed one, I'd be kind of tempted to get some still wool and just give the edges a tiny bit of a head start revealing that beautiful brass just waiting to be unveiled. The camera is a bit thicker than most cameras around this size, and it's got a noticeable heft to it as well. It's not heavy per se, but much more significant feeling in your hand than its countless plastic, aluminium and magnesium alloy shelled brethren. It sits in the hand very comfortably, and that thickness and weight make it feel wonderfully positive. The leathery, rubbery grip that wraps around the front panel and around to the thumb rest also adds to the secure feeling grip. The multifunction wheel, shutter mode dial and exposure compensation dial all sit in very sensible and comfortable positions. The other control buttons are typical Pentax fare, small but with a very affirmative clicky action. No wishy-washy mushy sponginess to be found here. The screen is bright and decently viewable out in the sunny world, not the best you'll find out there but perfectly serviceable, and it's one of those wonderfully handy tilty screens which I love so much for making high and low angle shooting so much more easy and pleasant. The menu system is also very typical Pentax, pretty much identical to their current DSLR line and of course the joyful little munchkin, the Pentax Q. The menus are plain, boring looking but extremely serviceable and logically laid out. The info screen, called up at any time during shooting with a single button press, is similar. Just a boring, simple grid, but it gives you instant access to pretty much every setting you'd ever need to rapidly fiddle with on the fly in between shots. It ain't fancy looking, but it's one of the most efficient shooting menus you'll find out there. There's a pop-up flash if you're the kind of person who likes on-camera flashes for some reason. Sadly, it's not on hinges that allow you to tilt up, for some softer bounce flash action, so not that useful to me. The strap lugs, which I normally wouldn't mention at all in a camera view, are getting one mention here because of their position. They're not on the side where they can press into your palms when you're using the camera, which I hate. Instead, they're clean and out of your way on the front sort of corner bit there. It's a nice touch. The USB connection and HDMI out port lie under a solid feeling flap at the side. And finally, that lens up front is a very pleasant stack of glass. Starting at the 35mm equivalent of a nice wide 28mm at f1.8, its 4 times optical zoom reach will stretch that out to 112mm. And here's the glorious news. It only slows down to f2.5 even at max zoom. And that's pretty awesome. In fact, it's best in class. The only compact camera out there with a faster lens at maximum zoom is the Panasonic DMC LX7. And that stops out at f2.3. And that only reaches out to 90mm equivalent, not the 112mm of the Pentax. So I'm still calling it a win for the MX-1. So that's the basic hardware covered. It's time to move on to what it's spitting onto my memory cards. Alright then, with its DSLR heritage interface and the compact MX film DSLR design heritage, you'd expect the MX-1 to be aimed at photographers looking for something that offers up plenty of control, uses high quality optics and generates nice clean image files. And that's what you get. The lens is indeed a well designed bit of optical engineering. It's nice and crisp, it's super quiet in operation, as is the shutter by the way. So this makes it ideal for street shooters looking to stay subtle. And the focus is fairly nippy and very accurate. In all lighting conditions it consistently locks on without annoying hunting or false positives. And of course you can shoot in RAW. But I found doing so, regardless of using a high speed memory card, made the shot to shot performance a bit laggy. Much, much more than I'm used to seeing, in fact. 
In JPEG only mode, it was significantly faster, of course, but I like the security of shooting JPEG and RAW. So if my JPEG file isn't quite where I wanted it to be once I get it on the computer, I can fix it with the RAW. And I do advise sacrificing that shot to shot performance for RAW files, especially if you're shooting in low light. Because while at anything up to ISO 1600 things are generally well behaved, if you need to go past that, image noise rapidly becomes an issue. And the in-camera noise reduction of the JPEGs is wildly aggressive, leaving you with rather mushy images. RAW will save you there. That 4x zoom gives you a very nice and flexible range of control. Remember. Zoom lenses aren't just so you can avoid walking closer to things because you're lazy. It's a creative tool for altering the field of view in your images. And because the MX1 optics stay fast even at maximum zoom, this functionality is even more useful than it often is on compacts whose lenses often stop down rather rapidly the instant you start zooming. Even the utterly superb and much more expensive Sony RX100 Compact, which I love to bits by the way, annoyingly stops all the way down to f4.9 at maximum zoom. Now I just mentioned before that it's not exactly a beast in low light. The relatively small sensor works against it here, but so long as you don't go past ISO 1600, it'll actually do a pretty nice job in most low light conditions. And pleasantly, you can manually adjust the limits of the automatic ISO setting. So even if you're shooting in full on dummy mode, you can stop it going to the noisy places that live up near the maximum ISO of 12,800. And again, that fast lens helps you out here in the dark as well. There's even a dedicated in-camera HDR mode. Just flick to it on the mode dial, point and shoot, and the camera churns away for a few seconds and spits out a surprisingly smooth and very natural looking HDR image. Quite impressive really. There's no weird haloing or transition kookiness, just a nice clean image that looks how you'd want it to. The MX-1 will also do a pretty bang up job at macro shooting, and you don't even have to flick a switch in a menu somewhere to change the lens into macro mode like you do on so many other cameras. Nope, the Pentax just slides instantly and automatically into macro focus mode when you need it, as you need it, and then back again just as painlessly. It's a bloody joy to use actually, and the results are fantastic. And I took a whole bunch of macro stuff I'm not even showing you in this video because I was enjoying its macro mode so much I started shooting a little side project with it. Maybe you'll see them someday, maybe even in a book. Point is, it's one of the most elegantly implemented, most painless and easy to use macro modes I've ever used. And the image detail quality from that lovely lens at these super close distances is pretty damn nice too. There's even a built-in ND filter, just like on the Pentax Q, and it is an amazingly handy thing. If you don't know what it is, it's a bit like sunglasses for your camera. It lets you keep the lens wide open and, or, keep your shutter speed slow, even in bright conditions that would usually preclude this ability. It's a wonderfully handy and powerful tool to give you more creative options. And all from a menu option, instead of having to remember to carry around a separate screw-on filter. And having a built-in ND filter means the difference between shots like this and this. And of course it should go without saying that the built-in ND filter works just as well in video mode as it does in stills. Speaking of video mode, of course there's the requisite video mode. It's very simplistic as, irritatingly, all Pentax cameras tend to be when it comes to video. Just a couple of modes on offer, Full HD 1080p at 30 frames per second or 720 at 30 or 60 frames per second. There's also high speed and time lapse shooting modes, though these cap the resolution at 640x480 VGA, so they're kind of fun but not all that useful in a practical sense. Naturally, my predilection was to stick with the top-end 1080p stuff, and overall it was a reasonably pleasant experience. Not nearly as sophisticated as that from the Sony RX100 I talked about before, but certainly completely acceptable, and in many cases really quite pleasant. Video mode has been something Pentax have lagged in for some time now. Only recently have they shown some real progress, and much like the Pentax K30 DSLR I reviewed not too long ago, I think they're finally on the right track. The sensor-based stabilization does a pretty decent job at smoothing out the jitters, although sometimes, if you give it a harsh enough challenge, like filming a rocking boat from another rocking boat, at maximum zoom, it will get fooled into spazzing out a bit, but overall it was pretty well behaved. You can shoot with continuous autofocus, which again is fairly basic, using only the center point, but it works nicely enough, smoothly transitioning when required, and even more importantly, in utter silence. And even in the dark it does a pretty reasonable job, where many cameras would be lost in a world of helpless hunting. 
But if you're like me, you'll be after a little more predictability and we'll stick to single autofocus, locking the focus point at the start of recording. As with stills, low light will throw a bit of noise into your image, although here in video mode it's a bit cleaner as the camera isn't doing its aggressive JPEG noise reduction routine that results in a bit of soft blotchiness. Instead here it's more subtle. It is still going on, so at the worst of cases it is a bit soft, but what noise there is is a fairly fine grain noise and more on the luminance side than the chromatic noise side, which basically means it doesn't look too harsh or too digital. It's not exactly like film grain, but it's kind of reminiscent. At least it's close enough not to be totally abhorrent eye abuse. But in any reasonable light, the detail and crispiness is actually very nice. It's a very natural feeling image. It's sharp without being over sharpened. Color and tone transition smoothly, and the dynamic range is rather good too. With the right settings, the motion blur is fairly pleasant, just slightly on the schmeary side, but not too bad. There is no input for an external microphone, sadly, and the onboard mics, while being a bit vulnerable to wind noise, actually do a pretty decent job. Certainly good enough for the types of duty a compact camera will be pressed into service for. And as you've been seeing throughout the video, even though the sensor is on the smaller side of the scale, thanks to the wide apertures available on the lens, getting a shallow depth of field isn't too difficult. And the aesthetic of that background blur is, I think, rather pleasant. Smooth and even tones. It's a very gentle blur. It's not an extreme effect, but it's really quite pretty and can be used to great effect. And of course that macro mode I gushed on about works in video mode too. And it's a point in favour of the view screen when I'm able to control my focus plane accurately enough handheld in macro mode video, which is a challenge even at the best of times. Not too shabby. Everything about shooting with the Pentax MX-1, aside from the fairly middle of the road high ISO stuff, I rapidly felt a swell of affection for. The camera is extremely endearing to shoot with, from the feel of it to its subtle but attractive looks, how wonderfully quiet and non-intrusive it is, that tilty screen, the excellent access to manual control, the exposure compensation dial, the secure sense of its rugged build without looking like an ugly tank, those brass plates. Some cameras, no matter how good they are, are just a camera. But somehow, the MX-1 is one of those rare cameras that doesn't feel like a oh, camera. It's something special somehow, something almost organic, something that digs into a part of your brain you're not entirely aware of that just makes you enjoy its presence somehow. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but trust me, if you ever go shooting with one, you'll start to feel it. Ah, but here's the thing. Why would you buy this when this is out there? I've mentioned this little fella in the review a few times already. This is the Sony RX100, and this is, in my opinion, and I've said this in several videos here and there all over the place, this is the best camera you can spend your money on that will fit in your front pocket. This is the best compact camera on the market at the moment, and I'm not alone in that opinion. Lots of people love this camera to bits, even professionals, you know, people who are way more skilled and knowledgeable than I am love this little beastie. So as much as I've just gushed about this camera, why would you buy this one when this one is sitting out there on the market? I mean, what, it doesn't make, how does it make sense to you in your brain to get this when you could be getting this? Well, there are a few reasons and they are rather compelling reasons. First off, this has the tilty screen on the back. Don't underestimate it. It is wildly handy, particularly if you're like me and you like to get that high angle or that low angle in particular. I'm a nut for shooting the low angle stuff. You get below eye level, things starts looking more interesting. It's just one of the things about photography that you learn as you go. And I love shooting low angle stuff. And because I've got a bad back and bad knee, the tilty angle screen on this thing makes it so much easier. Neither of which have a uh, optical viewfinder or an optical viewfinder attachment. So you can't sort of get away with the using that. So the tilty screen is a lifesaver in many situations. The other thing, manual control on this is much easier to get to than it is on this. This has a very simplistic set of dials and controls on it. It has every bit the manual control you can get on both of them. You can go full on manual in either, either case. This is a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient, a little bit cleaner, a little more sensible, a little more just a little more old school in the way you adjust things and the exposure compensation dial on the top is a godsend as well. That gives you sort of instant ability to get high key and low key stuff and just play and that is a rather important thing in my mind as well. The look and feel. This is much, much bigger than this is. I mean, check out that. It's, it's significantly larger in all dimensions, but while that means it doesn't slip into your front pocket nearly as easily, it'll ride in your back pocket fairly comfortably. Um, but th that extra thickness, that extra bolt, that extra weight actually makes it feel nicer in hand. This thing, very, very beautiful design, very light, very clean. It's made of that magnesium metal and stuff, and it, oh, it's just, it feels lovely. But when you're shooting with it, 
it's just a little bit too small and, and it's slippery and you never feel entirely secure with it but you put up with it because it's such a damn fine camera with this thing with that that leathery rubbery front and the extra thickness and just the feel of it the weight of it it's much more secure and confident in your hand it just feels better when you're out there shooting with it when you got it in your hand it just oh it speaks to somewhere deep in your soul as a photographer it just feels so much nicer to hold now performance wise this will beat that in every aspect in stills mode it's a little bit sharp a little bit cleaner much much better in low light in video mode it's a lot more flexible manual autofocus works better you've got sony's peaking on there this in every way will outperform that but is it worth it because you can get this for about 450 460 aussie dollars this thing will cost you sort of 700 aussie dollars 800 aussie dollars or thereabouts depending on where you get it that's a huge price difference and that gentle viewer that is where you're going to get hung up choosing between these two they are both brilliant brilliant options like i said this one is the better performer for pure performance freaks but if you're under a budget i mean this is a very expensive camera let's be honest seven eight hundred dollars for a compact camera it seems insane but the people who own them love them to bits because they are that good they are worth seven or eight hundred dollars well kind of i mean if you get, if you get a lot of use out of them it's oh such a good camera but for 450 odd dollars this has an amazing bang for buck just a superb value proposition so if you are like many of you out there i know i get people writing to me all the time all oh, bluntly what's the best camera i can get for under 500 dollars what's the best camera i can get for this much money or this much money and this much money and i generally don't answer those questions because i don't like making buying decisions for strangers out there but for my money you know if i was deciding between these two cameras whether to spend nearly 800 dollars or whether to spend just over 400 dollars ooh, i'd be umming and ahhing long and hard the you know inside deep inside i would want to be able to justify the ridiculous expense of this camera but i think i would wind up going for that camera i really do i really honestly do because it's a better value proposition the performance to dollar bang for buck the longevity of it's built like a tank but doesn't look like it's built like a tank this this is a workhorse this is a brilliant little camera Ooh, it's a tough decision from here on out when you're trying to buy a compact camera to uh, supplement well, your cell phone, basically, and be somewhere else between your mirrorless or your DSLR. Anyway, thanks for watching. I am Blunty. Good luck choosing. <laughs> I'll catch you next time.